I'm going to begin in verse 32. I want you to pay close attention to the switch, the change that takes place in, thir in verse 35, but just keep that in mind. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32 says, And what shall I say more, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, of Bark, of Samson, of Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in, in, in uh, fight, uh, turned the, the, the uh, flight of armies of the aliens, women received their dead, turned to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they may obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were, sl uh, uh, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they, with, uh, without, that they without us should not have been made perfect. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we pray that we might realize that the saints that have suffered for you and the saints that have suffered in this world, and uh, Father, that we might understand something about sufferings and that we might understand something about prayer as we continue our topic and realizing how that in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving we can let our requests be made known to you and your peace that, guard, uh, that keeps our heart and mind will uh, guard our heart and mind through Christ Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We are talking about prayer. You'll see how this ties in in just a little bit but uh, what we did we, we, after we talked about how we have this privilege to go before God and let our requests be made known and don't have to worry about if we say everything right or not in prayer. At the same time, we thought, well, we need to, even though we can say everything and pray about everything, we shouldn't just be children. We should grow up and understand the things that God is doing and, and how he responds in, in response to our prayers and some of the things that we should pray about and grow up a little bit in prayer. And so we, we kind of stopped talking about what we were looking at in Philippians and introduce the subject of prayer and I'm going to start out with the negative I said I'm going to give you some warnings about the hindrances to prayer and when I say hindrances to prayer remember I'm not talking about your prayer being hindered where God can't get it and you'll understand what I mean by that in a few minutes but but I'm not talking about hindering God from answering your prayers I'm talking about hindrance to your prayer life because of unscriptural teaching I'm talking about about hindrances that come into your life because false teachers have taught you things causing you to ask God for things which is contrary to God's revealed will for God's purpose and working in your life. You know, God's going to do what he said he's going to do. And if someone teaches you something other than that and you're praying contrary to what God is doing, well, God's not going to change what he's doing because you asked him to do something else. And so you need to learn what God is doing and pray according to that. But people have hindered you by, by telling you things that God would do for you that God didn't say he would do for you. And, uh, and, and so I, I prepared you for that. That's what I'm referring to as a hindrance to prayer. Um, I, uh, in order to do that, last week I actually took a subject that is rampantly taught and, uh, and tried to expose the falseness of it. The, the sheer nonsense of it, biblically from the Bible. There is a concept of people saying that part of the, of the purpose of tongues is a prayer language that makes you closer to God, that brings edification into your life and causes you to be spiritual. And, and, and I dealt with that for the purpose of not teaching about what is tongues, although I had to teach what tongues is. Tongues is a language, a human language, used to, to share the gospel with lost people. Since God's not lost, you don't have to speak to God in tongues. He don't need you to preach to him the gospel. He don't need you to talk to him in tongues. But people do that because they've misused a couple, only a couple passages of scriptures and the whole doctrine of what tongues is all about. And they, they teach that, that praying is this prayer language. 
Well, I wanted to expose that to you so that you realize that this is a rampant teaching that goes on so many different places in all kinds of denominations, whether it's the, the charismatic Catholics or whether it be the Pentecostals who are more known for that, the op apostolic group. But it, but it goes on in other places that you might not be aware of. It goes on in, in the, uh, uh, the kingdom halls. It goes on in the, uh, uh, the Masons in, in their secret meetings. Uh, the, the things that, that they go, the, that false teaching is in all kinds of other places and, and, and it's all in other kind of religions as well. But, but, but my point to you is if, if, if so many people think it's right and so many people are doing it, how did they get there? How did that happen? And we concluded with the verse in 1 Corinthians 12 where the Apostle Paul begins to introduce the subject and reminded the Corinthians that they were led about by these dumb idols. Dumb idols? Not dumb and stupid. We're talking about dumb can't talk. Well, how does an idol that can't talk lead someone astray? The next verse says, if a man say. People begin to listen to men rather than the word of God. And as a result of that, they've been misled. And you can be seriously misled. There's a whole bunch of people think they have a spiritual walk with God and they practice this, thinking they're honoring God and none of it is even biblical. Now, that's, it becomes a bitter pill, especially to those who have been involved in that, but when you study it from the Bible, none, none of it's scriptural. So that was just the introduction of, of unscriptural praying, hindrances to your prayer life, because that isn't the, that's not positive to your prayer life, it's a hindrance to your prayer life. It don't make you spiritual at all. I want to deal with another one today, and that is one that preachers will say. Remember, that's how people get led astray by the false teachers. Preachers say, God does not want his children to suffer, to be sick, or to be poor, or to be in danger, or, in, in, or to be harmed, to suffer injustice. Therefore, it, if you experience any of these and pray to God, he will certainly take it away. And if not, then there's something wrong with you, spiritually. It, there's sin in your life. You lack faith. You're in unbelief. You're saying, I'm sick, when you ought to say, I'm not sick. You know, that's the word of faith, they say. And for them, belief, to be in unbelief, is to believe you're sick when God says, no, you're not sick. He took sicknesses away. And so you're not just, when you're, you know... You got the flu, and you're in the bathroom, and, and all that. You're, no, this is not happening to me. <laughs> now, the idea that preachers say that God does not want his children to suffer, to be sick, to be poor, to be in danger, to be harmed, to suffer injustice. And therefore, those things do come, and so all you got to do is pray, and since God doesn't want it, it'll go away. If it don't go away, there's something wrong with you, your spiritual life. There's sin in your life, whatever. they got a whole list of things, and we'll deal with some of those things as we go on. I just wanted to deal with that concept because there can be nothing more frustrating, discouraged, discouraging, disappointing to a person's prayer life than to suffer these things, to pray about it, and, and then nothing change. <laughs> you know, that concept. I, I actually had to do this because I thought to myself, do preachers really say that? You know, kind of, I'm putting like, words of things I've heard through the times. So yesterday afternoon, I don't have cable. I got regular TV antenna, but you know, with that now you get 38.1, 38.2, 38.3. There's this new channel, 18, it's got 18.1, 18.2, 18.3, 18.4, and both of those have religious teachings on them. So I decide, okay, I just take the remote, every place I stopped, it's prosperity, it's health, it's healing, God doesn't want you. And I thought, okay, I'm not lying to the people. I can, I can stand here and tell you, preachers do say this. But you know, we live in a world that, well, I attended uh, two, uh, paid respects to two people who have passed away this week. Here's Ruth. Oh, she got her, she's got her little walker tucked in her, her thing. It was a moment ago, it was sitting out in the aisle. I was going to point that out to you. You got Pete back there with a patch on one eye and a peg leg on the other. Not peg leg, but he's got a crutch. <laughs> I, I told him I'm going to buy him a pirate's hat, you know. But, but you know, the point is, is that statement that people are made, that pe preachers make, they sit there and say it to a congregation that are suffering the same thing. This congregation is suffering. There's, something, there's nothing more disconnected from reality and truth as that statement is. 
Because everybody they're talking to is suffering. Mm -hmm. And they're saying God doesn't want you to suffer. Now, when they say God don't want you to suffer, what they mean by that is that God do, would not let his children suffer. He wouldn't let these things happen to you. Well, if God wouldn't let, why is it happening? Well, now they're going to put it on you, saying you're not a believer. You're an unbelief. You're not claiming the promises of God and standing on the promises of God. And, and so they make it even harder on you. Now you've got a spiritual burden on your back as well as the physical problems you're suffering. And, 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 and so not, that is a discouragement to prayer. My point in reading you Hebrews chapter 11, there is some places where God intervened in people's lives and there was great victory in their life, wasn't there? But those are the exceptions. When he names of David and, and uh, Bark and Jephthah and Samson, well, how, was there another Samson? That era of time, there's one man, Samson, that God used to speak to the nation of Israel. That's only one person. He, he wasn't using that. Not, not anybody else had the power Samson had. God, God used certain men at certain times to, for a purpose that he had on this earth. But when you read in that passage, it went on and said, others suffered, and it started naming. No names, just what the ordinary people were going through. Those who were... Hero, heroes of faith. They died in faith having not received the promises. Why? Because the promises are future. Even, even when we talk about the nation of Israel and God's dealings with them, which we're going to look at in a moment, the fulfillment of God's promises to the nation of Israel will happen at the second coming of Jesus Christ when he comes back to earth. And for them there will be no sickness, there will be no sorrow, there will be no death even more. Because God's going to fulfill His promises to the nation of Israel at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Until then, when we just read in Hebrews of people in past Hebrew history that have suffered, and the writing of Hebrews is written to tell the Hebrew people who are going to yet go through the tribulation how to endure suffering, even more suffering and death, until Jesus Christ comes back. So, in, even when God was dealing with the nation of Israel, there was... And there's no such thing as God didn't want people sick or to suffer injustice or be harmed or in danger. He let them. Now, he gave them the ability to go through it. He gave them his word to guide them through those times. But, so that's the nation of Israel. Now, in the dispensation of grace where God has turned to us Gentiles, this is called the time of the long-suffering of God. Because God is not interrupting the worldly system. Satan is the god of this world. It's still sin-cursed and God hasn't interrupted it. But he has dispensed his grace to mankind to save us from our sins so that at the rapture we get caught up in a new glorified body that has no sickness, no sorrows, no deformities, no broken bones, lost limbs. In the rapture is the time in which we'll have no more suffering after that. But until then, not only does it say in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, that the sufferings, plural, of this world are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. That passage goes on to say, The whole world groaneth and travaileth in pain until now, and not only they, but we also ourselves, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan within ourselves, waiting for, waiting for the adoption to it, the redemption of our bodies. Now there's God's word. So the preachers say one thing, and God's word says another. And so when you're praying, you need to pray and realize that God does allow sickness and sorrow and suffering. But God has promised empowerment, comfort, during that time of suffering. Not that it will go away, but that he has an answer for it. His grace that he told the Apostle Paul is sufficient for you. Now before we get to all those details, go with me to Romans chapter 6. And you'll need, a, uh, you'll need to keep a piece of paper in the book of Romans because by the, we'll be in a hurry to get back here to finish our message. You know, a man started a message one time and preacher getting ready to preach and he's looking at his notes and he says, where to begin, where to begin, where to begin? Some smart aleck yells out, the closest to the end as you can. <laughs> Okay, uh, Romans chapter 6. It says in verse 14, a verse that we're familiar with. I'm not going to teach the context of Romans 6. Romans 6 verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. 
Now there's a verse of scripture, there's so many details about that. Sin doesn't have to dominate your life, but it has no dominion over you. It can't even send you to hell anymore. Because the previous chapter told us where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And the grace of God brought salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. His payment for sin was so great that not only did it cover your past and present and future sins, but where sin abounds, grace overabounds. God's undeserved, unmerited favor abounds toward us in the fact that Jesus Christ did away with sin and sin has no more dominion over you. Now when he says that, he also said, Sin hath no more dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Sometimes we like to talk about the dispensation of grace, and we say, hey, we're not under the law, we're under grace. And sometimes some of you think that what it means to be not under the law, but under grace, means that there's nothing that you have to obey anymore. There's two things. You're not under grace, but under the law. <laughs> That'll keep you awake, won't it? <laughs> well, that's pretty good. <laughs> I didn't even try to do that. You're not under the law, but you're under grace. <laughs> if you're under the law, you'd have to be obedient to the law, right? If you're under grace, what does that mean? That I don't have to be obedient to anything? Does grace teach you some things? Well, if you're disobedient to grace, then that's not a very good response, is it? Now, sin won't have dominion over you because God, Jesus Christ, took care of sin. But the point is, is you're not just freed from the law to live any way you want. God has. You take the word obedience and go through Paul's epistles about being obedient. You're under, you're under grace. An illustration of that would be if, you, if we lived right now in, in China under a communistic regime. If you were under a communistic regime, there are certain things you can do and you can't do, and there's a lot, of, you're a lot of control by the government in your life, is there not? But if you're over here in the United States in a democratic republic nation that we have, under the Constitution of the United States, well, you're free, aren't you? Free to do anything you want? No, you're free to live under these rules. But these, these rules have a lot less control over you. They're just restricting some, they're supposed to be protecting our liberties by having laws that would strict people from, from taking advantage of you and hindering you and hurting you. Now that's the idea of the government. But the point is, under one or the other. You're not under the law, you're under grace. Well, I want to apply that to, to prayer. Because I want to show you so why some people pick out some things and say some things they do, not understanding the principle of what we call, what the Bible calls, right division. We were saying in Sunday school that there's more verses in the Bible that, talk, that teach you how to rightly divide the word of truth than 2 Timothy 2.15. This is one. Didn't that, didn't that teach you right division? You're not under the law, but under grace. Somebody was under the law, weren't they? It's not you. It was the nation of Israel. When God was dealing with Israel, he dealt with them under the law. Now he's dealing with us and Gentiles in the age of grace, and we're under grace. So that ought to affect how we pray. When you're under the law, there's a certain way you'll pray under the law. When you're under grace, there's a certain way you're going to pray under grace. And, and I want to develop that principle in light of, of, of the hindrances, what people put on, what they say that are not true. So look, keep your plate, put a piece of paper there. It'll be a long time before we're back in Romans. Why don't you go back to, with me to Psalms 4. Now, people have heard me preach before, realized, and I remember the first time I read the Bible all the way through during Bible college. You know, when you're in the Psalms, you, you, you know, this is a big book. The more you read it, the more you begin to use the expressions that are in it. So I caught on to this, and I was doing this for a long time. You'll see what I mean. Psalms chapter 4, verse 1. Hear me when I call, O God, of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. I used to always start out that way. Lord, hear my prayer. Now, you, you'll see, David does that, you know, some 12 different times in the Psalms. I, I, I want to point out a couple of them. Come over to chapter 17. 
It says in verse 1, Hear the right, O Lord, attend unto my cry, give ear unto my prayer that goeth out of my, uh, out of my feigned lips. Let my sentence come forth from thy, uh, thy presence. Let thine eyes behold the things that are equal. Drop, drop down to verse 6. It says, I have called upon thee, for thou wilt hear me. Uh, o God, incline thine ear unto me and hear my speech. Lord, examine me, listen to me, I'm calling, now hear me. And, and so he goes on. Uh, come all the way over to, let's go, jump all the way over to 102, Psalms 102. Again, it starts out, verse 1, Hear my prayer, O, o Lord, and let thy cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am in trouble. Incline thine ear unto me in the day when I when I call uh, when I when I uh, when I call answer me speedily. Down in verse six, <laughs> he, he starts describing all the things that he's suffering. <laughs> I like verse six. It says, "I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. I'm like an owl in the desert. I watch and I'm as a sparrow alone on the top of a of housetop." So he's just describing the despair of his life. And Lord, when I call, answer me. Hear me, oh Lord, hear me. So David is calling out that song. There was a man in Bible college who wrote a song, I'm a pelican. <laughs> Every time I see that, I think of that. But it's so descriptive, a pelican in the wilderness. That'd be a tough thing to go through. Now look over in Psalms 143. See, if you keep reading this, you'll start praying this way. Verse 1, it says, Hear my prayer, O Lord, give ear unto my supplication, in faithfulness answer me, and in righteousness. And enter not into judgment with thy servant, for, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. Lord, he's saying, Lord, hear me, and, and don't hold any sin against me, because if you looked at me, you'd see the sin. How could any man be justified in God's sight? David had no answer to that because David didn't understand the cross of Christ, did he? That it, Job asked the same thing. Well, Job said the same thing in the book of Job because when you're honest with yourself, if God's going to look down and hear you because you don't have any sin in your life, David said, well, you know, there's no man just. <laughs> I'm doing pretty good, but there's no one just in your sight. But, you know, we are. That's why Romans chapter 5, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. God declared us to be just. Because Romans chapter 4 teaches that when Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins, he paid for all of our sins, took, taking them away. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, God imputes the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the exchange. Your sin gets placed on Christ. His righteousness gets imputed to your account. God declares you to be just. Because he don't see any sin. So if you had to say, hear me because I'm righteous, and, and there's no, don't, don't look at me, don't examine me too much because there's no one just in your sight, that, that's not a prayer we would pray today. We are righteous in God's sight. Our sins are gone. They've been taken care of. David is praying as a man under the law and, and trying to do it, having righteousness under the law. Look, look at Psalms uh, 66. And this, this is, when we talk, if anybody was going to do a prayer seminar and talk about why you have unanswered prayer, this is always the verse that they go to. I don't have time, don't want to take the time right now, but I'm just looking at this over and over again this week. The context of the chapter don't even match what they're saying when they grab the one verse out of the context. But I'll grab the one verse out of the context. In, in Psalm 66, in verse 18, it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's why I was reading all those verses. Why does David keep saying, Lord, hear me, Lord, hear me, if we would have read in some of those other, examine me, know my heart, hear me, Lord. Why does he keep doing that? Well, because if he's got iniquity in his heart, God's not going to hear him. So he's begging God to hear a lot of times, people are praying, spend half their prayer time trying to get God's ear to hear them. Why would they do that? 
because they're praying as if they're under the law and not praying as if they're under grace. They don't understand the difference. When the Bible tells you that you're not under one, but you're under the other, there is a difference. It affects the way you pray. Now, go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Here, let's learn about law. When it says under the law, there is an administration of law. That is, just like when I use the illustration of a government under, under a communistic government, that, that rules over you, that you, you relate to your freedoms based on the administration that's over you. There is an administration over the nation of Israel that's called law. And they have to live and relate to God under that administration of law. Now, the administration of law is a covenant. It's a contract, a promise. God told Israel, if you do this, then I'll do this for you. And if you don't do this, I'm going to do this to you. And, and here's, here's one of the places where that's reiterated. Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. The first group failed already. So now their children have an opportunity to enter into the promised land. But, but I read to you, I'm, I'm going to read this a little bit sarcastically as preachers on television like to preach. Or, here, verse 6. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6. For thou art... A holy, for thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Isn't it great for you to be a special person unto God? You're, you're not like everybody else. God looks at you differently. You think that verse says, it's talking about you at all? <laughs> verse verse uh, 9. It says, Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. God's a merciful, loving God who keeps his promises to you. And as you read this, all these promises are yours. You're a special people. This is what God wants for you. And God will keep his promise. The promise if you don't have these things in your life, the problem must be with you. Well, what things are we talking about? Well, let's just keep reading. Um, verse 12. It says, Wherefore, it shall come to pass, if ye hearken unto these judgments, and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God will keep unto thee the covenant, and the mercy which he sware unto thy fathers. He, uh, and he will love thee, and bless thee, and multiply thee. He will also bless the fruit of thy womb. And the fruit of thy land, thy corn, thy wine, thine oil, the increase of thy kind, and thy flocks of thy sheep, uh, in the land which the Lord swore unto thy fathers to give thee. No miscarriages. See, God's saints, no, no woman would have a miscarriage in their, in their life. And it says, verse 14, Thou shalt be blessed above all people. There shall, not, there shall not be male nor female barren among you or among your cattle. The Lord will take, you, take away uh, from you all sickness and will put none of these diseases, uh, the diseases of Egypt, which thou knowest, upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. There you go. No sickness, no sorrow. And, and it goes on. That, that's a good one to stop at. The thee, you have to know the context, is the nation of Israel. It certainly wasn't Egypt, was it? <laughs> it got laid on Egypt. The people he's talking to is the people that left Egypt and is going to the land that he promised. All those references, the land and thy fathers, that's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. We're talking about God's promises to the nation of Israel. And he's on, law, on, the, way, on the way after they left Egypt and before they get into the promised land, they stopped at Mount Sinai and God gave them the law. And he's telling them if they keep the, state, the statements in these laws, this is how God was going to bless them. But there's another part of that covenant. Come over to chapter 28. Now I could show you both parts from 28. I'm just moving around a little bit. Deuteronomy 28. Verse 58 says, If thou wilt not observe, Deuteronomy 28, verse 58, If thou wilt not observe to do the words of the law that are written in this book, that thou mayest fear, uh, uh, fear this glorious and fearful name, the Lord thy God, 
Then the Lord will make, thy, will make thy plagues wonderful, and the plagues of thy seed, uh, even great plagues, and long continuance, and sore, uh, and sore sickness, and long continuance. You're going to get real sick, and you're going to stay that way for a long time. Boy. Moreover, he will bring upon thee all the diseases of Egypt, which thou was afraid of, and they shall cleave unto thee. Also, every sickness and every plague which are not written in the book. <laughs> There's even more <laughs> of this law. Them will the Lord bring upon thee until thou be destroyed. Now that's what it is to be under the law. God says, you keep my laws, I'm going to bless you, I'll take the diseases away. You break my laws, I'm going to curse you, and I'm going to put more diseases upon you than Egypt saw. And I'm going to keep doing it for a long time until you're destroyed. So God's dealing with the nation of Israel under the law, and certainly when they pray, no wonder David's praying about righteousness and praying about check out my heart, because he's approaching God from under the law. Now, David knew, God knew, Job knew, everybody knew that man has a sin problem and they're, they're bent towards sin. God already had an answer to all that. Uh, you, you can go to, uh, uh, go to 2 Chronicles chapter 6. But I'm going to read to you a verse, and, and you just know, need to know about this to study this even in more detail, that Leviticus chapter 26 does the same thing. This is, Leviticus was actually written to the parents of the children that, that Moses is writing to in Deuteronomy that failed God. But Deuteronomy 26, just know this about the chapter. You're going to 2 Chronicles. Leviticus chapter 26 takes the nation of Israel and shows them how they're going to go through five cycles of times in which not only will they be blessed of God, but they're going to turn from God and God's going to judge them. And then they're going to turn back and God will bless them again. But then when they turn back away from God the next time, he's going to judge them seven times more. It's going to get even worse than the first time they turned away from him. And this is going to happen in Israel's lifetime five different times. Until finally they get to this point where I'm, I'm going to read to you Leviticus 26 verse 40. It says, If thou shalt confess the iniquity, thy, their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with, with their trespasses which they have trespassed against me and that they, they have walked contrary to me and then how he's walked contrary to them. It goes on to say in verse 42, Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and my covenant with Abraham. And I will remember, and, what, and, I, and I will remember the land. And then it talks about how they're going to be restored once and for all, finally. So that Israel's history is a history of God blessed them, and then they go through cursing. And so there is this long time that they're going to they're go through these cycles, but ultimately it says if they confess, then ultimately there'll be one final time that God will bless, and they'll be blessed forever at that point. Now, the reason I say that to you is because you realize under the law, Israel wasn't going to not fail God. Of course they're going to fail God. Solomon understands the, the, what it is to pray under the law. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, Solomon has built the temple, understands that God dwells more than just in that temple, but that temple was a place where God would meet with the nation of Israel. And, and then, so in the dedication of that temple, Solomon begins to pray about Israel's relationship with God. And when I read these verses, I want you to click on, keep in mind, four words. Watch them pop out at you. I want you to see the word if. I want you to see the word confess. Because, boy, there's a lot of people not only praying, Oh, Lord, hear me. I confess my sins unto you. But catch the word if. Catch the word confess. Then catch the word then. And then catch the word here. Because if they will confess, then God will hear. So, uh, Solomon is talking, praying to God concerning his relationship, his promises to the nation of Israel. Uh, I'll break into verse 24, and, and you can back up and do more of this. But verse 24 says, And if thy people Israel, so now you know it's not talking about you, if thy people Israel be put to the worst before their enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and shall turn and confess thy name, and pray and make supplication before thee in this house, then hear thou from heaven, 
and forgive the sin of thy people, and bring them again unto the land which thou gave, gavest to the, them and to their fathers. Now, now you understand not only why David was praying that, you understand that their relationship to God, you understand how, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. By the way, that passage that it came from, the, the point is, is God is going to hear them. But, but it's that final time. But, but here, you can see then, that's exactly what they're doing. They're in sin, they've been judged of God, but if they're going to confess to God, they're going to acknowledge to God that we walk contrary, you were right, you kept your bargain, you judged us, we were sinners, we did wrong, then the Lord will hear. And until that happened, they can talk, and the Bible calls, the heavens will be like iron. It just goes up and God doesn't hear. And that's what people will tell you. The hindrance to prayer. God doesn't want you sick. doesn't want you to suffer. You're going through suffering. You're going through sickness. You're praying and God's not answering. Something's wrong with you. you got sin in your life. Where do they get that? Oh, by reading Israel under the law. But you know, Israel wasn't going to always be under the law. And we'll bring more of this up later when we talk about other things about prayer. There's going to be a new covenant to the nation of Israel. But, but that if and... Just look again. Look at verse 26. It says... what. When the heaven is shut up and there is no rain, because they, uh, because they have sinned against thee, yet if they pray toward this place and confess thy name and turn from their sin, which thou, dost, uh, which thou didst uh, aff uh, afflict them, then hear thou from heaven and forgive the sin of thy servant and of thy people Israel when, they have, when thou hast taught them the good way wherein they should walk and then they're going to send rain and so forth. All the way through this passage, it's all, it keeps following that same pattern. There's, they're, they're in sin, they're going to, uh, if, they, if they confess, then God will hear, and, and then they'll be blessed again. Um, one more before we leave here. Look at verse 36. If they sin against thee, for there is no man which sinneth not. See, the acknowledgement, we know we're going to fail you, God. And thou be angry with them, and deliver them over before their enemies, and they carry them away captive into the land far or near. Yet, if they bethink, now instead of using confess here, bethink. Bethink. Rethink the situation. Uh, the New Testament calls it repentance. To repent, to change their mind. And uh, about their captivity, verse 38, If they turn, return unto thee with all their heart, Verse 39, then hear thou from heaven. So that's when God will hear their prayers. When they do their part, then God will hear his, their prayers and do his part. Now that's real important because when you get into the book of Matthew, Jesus Christ comes to the nation of Israel and he's coming and John the Baptist precedes him, but even Jesus Christ, Matthew 4, begins to preach and say, repent, the kingdom of heaven's at hand. And he went through all Galilee and Judea, healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. Why? Well, he's calling them to repentance. And if they'll confess that we've walked contrary to your laws, and that's why Rome rules over us now, then Jesus Christ, their king, is going to come and bring their final blessing to them. Trouble is, they don't do that then. He's going to give it to them in the second coming. But he's healing all manner of sickness, all manner of disease in the land. Why? Because God never wants anybody to be sick? No. God ultimately, he doesn't want in the sense that ultimately he'll end all that. But until he ends it there, they're under the law. And if they repent, he's demonstrating he can bring the blessings that's been promised to them. That's what it's all about. There's a passage before we hit Romans. Look at John chapter 11. So many times when you read the Bible, you just see something different that you never saw before. Now when we say God doesn't want, remember when the preachers say it, when they say God doesn't want, there's a sense in which he doesn't want. That's why he's got a remedy, doesn't he? He's got the second coming of Christ and the rapture for us. So he's got a remedy. He doesn't want you to stay that way. But God is allowing that today. And they're trying to say God isn't allowing it. Yes, he allowed it all through Israel's time. He's going to allow the tribulation yet in the future. And this time we're living in, he's allowing it all the time. He's allowing it. But they're under the law, and, and that's how God's going to be dealing with them until 
the new covenant comes. But, but I want you to see this point. Here, here's a place where God, Jesus Christ is going to demonstrate his power. He's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. What a powerful passage. Um, you know, the, uh, Mary and Martha are saying, Lord, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. The Lord reminded them he's the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on him, though he were dead, yet shall he live. She says, yeah, I know, and that he'll live again in the resurrection of the last day. But the Lord also said, and he that liveth and believeth on me shall never die. There are going to be some people that are in the kingdom program. They're going to believe on Jesus Christ, never going to see death. They're going to go right into the kingdom. Christ is going to come back. For us, there's a different application. It's not talking about us, but we know that there's going to be some alive at the rapture of the church. Some are never going to see death. Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, but some will never even see death. So, so to demonstrate his power, he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Verse 38. It says, Jesus therefore gro began, again groaning in himself cometh to the grave. It was, a gra uh, it, it was a cave and the stone was laid upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for it hath been, he hath been dead four days. Lord, you don't want to roll that stone away. <laughs> it's not going to smell very good. Jesus said unto her, I said, said not I unto thee, if thou wouldest believe, thou shalt see the glory of God. And they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee, that thou hast heard me. And I know that thou, ha thou, thou hearest me always, be but because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. You have any idea how the story ends? <laughs> you know exactly how it ends. Here comes Lazarus, wrapped up like a mummy, hopping out of the, out of the tomb. Now, I know the resurrection overshadows everything. Go back to verse 41 there, where Jesus Christ addresses God the Father in verse 41. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. So he's already been praying. Verse 42, and I know that thou hearest me always. He don't pray like David, does he? There's no sin in his life to ever block a hindrance between God the Father and himself. He says, he's going to say it out loud about raising Lazarus, but he's already been praying about raising Lazarus from the dead. So he says, I know you always hear me, but for their sake, Lazarus, come forth, and Lazarus is going to come forth. But when he addresses God the Father, he makes that statement, you always hear me. That wasn't always true in David's life. Wasn't always true in Israel's life, was it? If they had sin in their life, God wouldn't hear them. Jesus Christ had no sin in his life, He's always got that connection with God the Father. Remember I asked you to hold your place in Romans? You're not under the law, you're under grace. Oh, the value of grace. In Romans you learn the fall of Israel is the riches of the Gentiles. And it says how much more their fullness. I'm just telling you some verses because we're not going to go there. How much their fullness. Israel is fullness is yet to come. That final resurrection unto life and blessing is coming in the future. In the meantime, Paul says, I would not that you be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceit, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in, and so all Israel shall be saved. We live in a time in which God stopped his dealings with Israel, and their fullness awaits our fullness. And that they're blinded in part, not all of them, just the unbelieving part of the nation is blinded, until the until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, till we enter into our fullness, our blessing, the rapture is up. Then God goes back and all Israel shall be saved. That's what the tribulation is going to bring about, the salvation of the nation of Israel, the believing remnant, and Jesus Christ comes back and the Israel goes into their fullness. So their fullness is future. Ours is even going to come before theirs. I say all that to you to show that we're different than Israel. Now Romans chapter 4. Romans chapters 3 and 4 are talking about the completed work of the cross. Remember, 
that the, the, the fall of Israel is the riches of the world. The diminishing of Israel is the riches of the Gentiles. The, by God stopping his dealings with Israel, he brought salvation to us Gentiles. And Paul said even then that I'm the apostle of Gentiles. I magnify my office, least, lest by any means I might provoke the emulation, them which are my flesh, and save some of them. The, the fall of Israel is the salvation of the world. Salvation comes to all mankind. We're talking about salvation from our sins, not salvation from sickness and suffering. That's future. But salvation from our sins, from the penalty of our sins, before a holy God. And it's all about how Jesus Christ, and you can sum it up just if you look at chapter 4 and, and verse 22. It says, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness, referring to Abraham believing God. And God imputed righteousness to Abraham, but, but go beyond that. Look at verse 23. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. That wasn't said back there for Abraham's sake. But for us also to whom it, righteousness, shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. What did God want us to believe? Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Died and took care of our sins, rose from the dead so he could declare us righteous. When will God declare you righteous? When you believe that. When you believe what Jesus Christ accomplished in the cross, that he died for your sins, was buried, and rose again, when you believe that that was the complete payment of your sins, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to you, and you're declared righteous. Because there's no sin in your life, right? Not because you didn't practice sin. It's because Jesus Christ took away the sin. As a result of that, Romans 5 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Think God's going to lay upon you the diseases of Egypt? You think God's going to judge you in any way for your sins? If he did, you'd be in hell. No, you have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom also? <laughs> you don't just have peace with God, you have something else. We have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We stand in the grace of God, undeserved, unmerited favor of God. We stand before God, always in his favor. And rejoice in the hope of the glory. Oh, we, we, we're blessed with, by God's grace, the standing in grace now, and just looking forward to when we're raptured out. Now, you know why I read that to you? Is under the law, sin could stop prayers from reaching to heaven. And they would pray, and they would confess their sin, then according to God being under law, then God would hear, and then God would bless. That's prayer under the law. You know, under the grace, we are complete in Christ. And remember what Jesus Christ said? Thou dost always hear me. That is true of your life. That's praying under grace. That's why Paul said in our study of Philippians, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known. Don't, don't have to start out, Lord! And then confess your sins. See, a lot of people are being taught how to pray under the law, how to live under the law, how to respond to God under the law. You need to realize being under grace even changes the way you pray. And what you realize, you have this standing before God in prayer. He always hears you because you're accepted in the beloved. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, I pray that we would understand what you're doing in the world, why disease and lack of disease is, relates to Israel's program and the future kingdom. Father, I pray that we would understand that we're in a, a delay of that future kingdom in a time in which the message today is the message of your grace and salvation from sin. And Father, those of us who have responded in faith and have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection as the complete payment of our sins, that Father, not only are we saved, we have access and a standing before you in grace, and you do always hear our prayer. Thank you, Father, for such a privilege. May we not be groveling and crying out and begging you to hear when you're just standing there with open ears to hear our, our concerns. And may we understand more about how you're going to operate in our life once we do pray as time goes on. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>